So remember the problems with sequencing a sequence assembly. The first problem is if I have a genome, and I'm just going to draw my genome to be a straight line for the sake of this discussion. If I have a genome and I do just a little bit of sequencing, and I don't do very, very much sequencing, then I'm never going to get a good assembly because I'm not going to have enough data to overlap all of the gaps. Okay? So one problem is if I don't do enough sequencing, I can't put everything together and recreate what my original sequence was. That's a really unusual problem to have these days. Very rarely do we have that problem. Usually we actually have so much data that it gives us a different kind of problem. And one of the problems that we have if we have too much data is, in fact, we have some regions. So imagine if you have a region that appears twice in the same genome and it's identical. What you're going to have at that region, you're going to have twice as much DNA there compared to everywhere else. If you just try and map the reads and count how frequently do you find things. Because you're going to find um, one piece of DNA from this copy and one piece of DNA from this copy. So when you count them, you actually get more. So there are actually some protocols when you're doing sequence assembly where you can normalize the number of reads. So you say, I just want to have this number of reads. And if I see regions where I have too many, I'm going to throw away those reads. It's called normalization. Uh, and that there's uh, several different protocols where you, where you can do that. But the bigger problem is with these repeat regions is if the repeat region, of course, is much longer than your sequence size. And so if you have a region that's repeated, and that repeat region is much longer than your sequence size, so let's say this region is 2,000 base pairs long, and it's identical. If you only have 100 base pair reads, when you do the assembly, you end up with basically a sequence that overlaps this end and a sequence that over overlaps this end, and then the same over here. And you'll have a sequence that overlaps this end and a sequence that overlaps this end. And the problem that the assemblers have is how do we know whether the order is A, B, A going to B, and then C going to D, or is it A going to D and, and C going to B? Right? Because you can't tell because you don't have a piece of, of data that starts here and goes all the way across. So that's one of the reasons that we do these larger insert make paired libraries like I just talked about, because then if we make this, if this is 2,000 base pairs, and we have our insert that's 3,000 base pairs, and we've sequenced 150 bases and 150 bases, when we do the assembly, we can say, aha, I know that this fragment and this fragment are connected because I have a piece of DNA, and I know that they should be about 3,000 base pairs apart because that's the median size of my fragments. And then the same over here as well. I know I've got pieces that are 3,000 base pairs apart. And so I know that these two fragments are connected. However, however, it's still expensive to do sequencing, right? And so you have to make a judgment. Do you want to have 500 base pair fragment libraries? Do you want to have 3,000 base pair fragment libraries? Do you want to have 300 base pair fragment libraries? And each sequencing group, facility, person, has their own preference, because they all have pros and cons. As I mentioned, if you have 300 base pair fragment libraries, you can overlap the sequences. If you have 3,000 base pair fragment libraries, you can map longer regions. 